It's the Queen City Music Podcast. The podcast devoted to the local music scene in Charlotte, North Carolina. Here's your host, Matthew Ablin. Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the Queen City Music Podcast. This month, I am happy to bring you an interview I did with the acoustic quartet Province of Thieves. This group comprises Jenny Brooks, Brad Davidson, Parker Foley, and Greg Moore. The Province of Thieves is known for their fantastic harmonies, and to me, the harmonies are reminiscent of Crosby, Stills, and Nash, or even the Eagles. This interview was recorded a few months ago while the band was in the midst of recording a new album. That album is now complete, and they are having a release party on January 27th at the Evening Muse. So after listening to this interview, go out and get some tickets and head out to support this wonderful local act. All right, I'm pretty excited to have Province of Thieves with me here today. I've got Greg Moore. Hey, guys. And Brad Davidson. Thanks for having us. So, fellas, are you originally from the Charlotte area? How about you, Greg? Uh, yes, born and raised. One of the one of the uh, few people you will actually run into these days around the Charlotte area who born in Presbyterian Hospital and and you know, stayed here my whole life, except for time in the military. Wow. I can start to use a third hand for the, mo- the original Charlotteans I know now. <laughs> right. I, usually I say it's like one or two hands and now I can add yeah. a third. How about you, Brad? Uh, actually from Mooresville originally, but grew up in the area as well. Um, yeah, my, my family was one of the first out on uh, Lake Norman before it was trendy. So I, I had the good fortune of growing up there. Okay. What's, what's your musical background, Brad? Um, pretty extensive. I mean, I come from a musical family. My mother was a piano teacher. Um, my father you know, sang in the choir and played accordion and piano. Mm-hmm. And so I started in, um, you know, singing in church and, uh, was in the band, played trumpet and French horn, moved okay. on to, uh, singing in chorus. And I was actually in an acapella group in college. Wow which was a lot of fun. Barbershop Quartet? Uh, no, it was actually, it was, <laughs> it's a group called the UNC Clefhangers. It okay. was a, a fair, semi-well-known uh, group in the area. Wow. Um, but got out of school and 10 years later realized I had kind of stopped doing music and um, was talking to a friend of mine one day and had, had been thinking, it would be really cool to learn how to play the guitar so I could do something musical. And just out of the blue, he said, uh, so I've got this guitar sitting in the top of my closet. <laughs> Do you know anybody who'd want that? So um, I got a hold of it, put Destiny. some strings on it. And within a couple of years, Greg made me start playing in a praise band and the rest is history. Right. Uh, that, that was all me. Well, what's your background, Greg? Uh, very similar. Um, church, uh, you know, grew up, you know, my mom and dad weren't particularly musical, but they did sing in the choir. Um, so as I was growing up, it was a lot of, uh, church choir, handbell choir, uh, fifth grade, I started playing alto sax. So mm-hmm. I stay, you know, that was, that was the instrument that I played in the, okay. in, in the band, uh, um, the Hawthorne junior high and Garinger high school, you know, marching band was alto sax. Um, I picked up the guitar when I was roughly 15, I went and bought a, you know, $75 electric guitar and a horrible sounding amp. And, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, you know, and I told my parents, like, I really want a guitar and, you know, they were, they were pretty, you know, iffy about, you know, getting me uh, another musical instrument. Um, but, uh, when they heard me making all the racket with that horrible electric guitar, dad, that Christmas, uh, you know, Santa, Santa brought me a, an acoustic. Okay. Uh, so I, I sat down and I never took any lessons on guitar, but I, you know, just got an Eagles songbook and started teaching myself chords and, and been, been playing guitar ever since. I won't say how long it's been right. since then, but it's been, you know, three decades. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so what the, how did you guys come together to, for Province of Thieves, I, I, I if you if you don't know about Province of Thieves, if you check out their website, what's the, what's the website again? Address, fellas. Uh, Provenceofthieves.com. There you go. If you go to their website, they actually have a listing of their history, so you can read through the history. So uh, needs, it needs to be updated. We, we you know, <laughs> it's, it's a couple of years behind. Well, know? it's really interesting that the way you guys have it laid out, because you know, you kind of go here's here's a brief history of how this happened, and then. Uh, this and this year, this was going on, and right. this year, this was going right. on. So, can you fill us in a little bit so we don't have to go to the was, website? It was a kind of yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it was kind of a progression, but but uh, you know, we, we had to go back in time, you know, a little further back than six years ago. Right. Uh, my wife runs a ballet program from Robinson Presbyterian Church in, okay. in East uh, Mecklenburg County, off of Harrisburg Road. Sure. And uh, 
uh, Brad's daughter was one of the first students that Amanda had, and and Brad's daughter Emily was in the program for boy seemed like for forever eleven uh, years. Yes, uh, wow. It w- was um, so that was sort of the basis of Brad and I getting to, getting to know one one another. Um, and in two thousand and five, the church itself decided to launch a contemporary worship service. Right. And um, I have I, I had been playing at another church uh, electric guitar uh, for Charlotte East Fellowship, uh, which met out in the university area for several years. Um, and Robinson asked me to come help with that contemporary service. Uh, so I went to do that. And that's when that's really the first time Brad and I really started playing together musically as we, you know, we knew each other, but we just hadn't. Uh, that was the first sort of musical collaboration. And we did that for. I, I was the leader of the worship service for about a year, and then I moved on to another church, and Brad took over as the leader of the worship service okay. for another couple of years. But I was very thankful for that first year because me singing and playing a guitar at the same time would never have happened <laughs> if Greg hadn't made me do that for the first uh, year or two while he was leading it. So. It's tough when you first start, isn't it? It is. It is. It was quite the challenge. Uh, hopefully, it's. I think it's second nature now. But whew. Yeah, when you first see somebody doing it, and if you've never done it, it's like, well, that doesn't look that hard. And then you start doing it and you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even when I'm playing, I don't know about you, Brad or, or Greg, but when I'm playing sometimes and I'm playing and singing, I still find there's certain things I can't sing and play at the same time. Right. So mm-hmm. in, in the duo I play with, my buddy, I'm like, you need to cover this because I can't play it and sing it at the same time. Yeah, there's there's certain musicians. Um, one of them I'd point out is Dave Matthews. Uh, if you ever watch what he's doing on the guitar... And what he's singing, it's, it's, he's really amazing. If you know how difficult it is to do both of those things at the same time and you watch what he's doing, it's, it's pretty impressive. You know, know, big artists that do that very well. I always think about like Hendrix, some of the funky rhythms and the, and the things he did singing. I'm like, how did he, wow, man, that's, oh, I can't do that on my guitar. (laughs) So anyway, the, the the base of the band really was uh, really was church. Okay. Um, and then uh, when Emily graduated, you know what really sort of kicked it off was um, Emily was graduating from high school, and she was also graduating from my wife's dance program because she was going to go to college. Um, so that particular um, ballet recital that June of 2012, I want to mm-hmm. say it was. It was. Amanda, my wife, went to Brad and said, "Can you play a song for her to dance to?" in the recital and Brad, you essentially said, I'll do you one better. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I went home and started working on, see if I could come up with a song just to write something instead of trying to play someone else's. Oh, uh, I'd written, nice. a, I'd written a few songs for church. So, um, and I, I came up with a song called dance back to me, um, that we did all in secret. So his, her mom didn't know about it. Nobody knew about it. Um, and, Talked to Greg and uh, Greg had started learning to play the mandolin. So I said, "Hey, wouldn't it be cool if the if the two of us um, you know played this together?" Sure. So we worked up the song, um, played it in the recital. My daughter danced. The mothers cried. It was you know <laughs> yeah. So is that the first time that you guys were writing original stuff together, or had you written original stuff in the past uh, away from each other? We had done original stuff with the uh, the contemporary service right. uh, prior to that. This was the first time we'd gone secular um, yeah. with anything. So. <laughs> secular. That's my mom's oh, word. Oh, man. I can't believe you're playing secular music. Right? <laughs> <laughs> she was going to have to get used to that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Brings me back to college here. Yeah. Those are yeah. Liturgical and secular music <laughs> right. should not be intertwined. That's right. We yeah. have striven to not to intertwine them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you guys are start. You, you do this uh, the the recital. You write the original tunes. What what happens from there? Well, we kind of looked at each other when the recital's over and said, "Man, this was fun. We should keep doing it." Uh, so, uh, you know, we started getting together and. And rehearsing, and and it was just the two of us. And I think it was that fall, mm-hmm. we got a gig at Madison's Coffee House out in Hemby Bridge, which is just a a little coffee house, um, still there. Um, not much traffic, you know. I figure, you know, if we're gonna break someplace in and actually do a, you know, start gigging somewhere, we'll start with a coffee house and mm-hmm. just see how it goes. Right. 
Uh, and Don St- Stadolsky was the owner of Madison's Coffee House at the time. And, you know, I walked in and I talked to her and, you know, kind of sight unseen without giving her any demo tapes. So I just said, hey, you're just going to have to trust us. We, we're not horrible. You know, <laughs> we're, we're not going to run your customers off, right? Um, we did clear the not horrible bar that time. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and then the first few gigs that we did were there. Uh, and mostly the folks that were showing up, showing up were folks that knew us. Okay. Uh, but, you know, you, you know, we, we sort of cut our teeth there, kind of figured out how to play a three-hour show and, right. you know, when to take breaks and what songs work, what songs don't work, you know. Yeah, we sort of found early on that when you take folk instruments like mandolins and guitars and ukuleles and you do 80s pop songs – gets people's attention so we that was the, the cornerstone of our early days i think that's say. <laughs> yeah you know trying to figure out what 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 would light a crowd up and what didn't you so know? you guys when you when you're starting out brad is singing and playing guitar greg is singing and playing mandolin yeah and then you we guys mixing it up we would switch. and then we switch yeah, yeah so we oh, would wow. switch so about halfway through the show we still we still do it this way uh, roughly about halfway through the show i'll go to guitar and brad will go to uke or he'll pick up the the irish bazooki or you know, he's throwing in harm, harmonica on a few songs. So right. um, the, the one thing that, that we do struggle with is we carry a lot of instruments to shows. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah. And I, and I have a new one I haven't even brought out to a show yeah. yet. <laughs> There's, uh, if you haven't seen Province of Thieves, I, I got to see you guys the first time a couple of the other week down at Moochie's Tavern. So I've seen these two guys. My God, you guys brought so much gear. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the floor monitors, they had a giant... A, Giant mixing board, which later I found out from Greg was just because, you know, the, it's for the full band. Right. Nor- normally it's a four piece yeah. band with percussion. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, and you got, so you got the light, you got the, the banner. And then, of course, there's a ton of instruments scattered on the floor. And I'm like, oh my God, I thought I brought a lot of stuff to gig, you know, with two guys. These guys are got this down. <laughs> Yeah, so. it's it's work though. The more stuff yeah. you haul, the more the more work it is. But uh, well, and it keeps the variety. So it's not just one one sound, one sound all the way yes. through. We can mix it up as we go, and that's right. Um, yeah, you know, keep it interesting. One thing I really enjoyed about you guys, and and even uh, listening to a little bit of your stuff online, was the harmonies. Mm. I've really l- enjoy listening to groups that have some harmony going on. How did you guys come about that? Well, I, I I came about it honestly just because, like I said, I I sang with acapella groups, so harmony was always you, know, you automatically go there if you're going to do vocals. And of course, what we did with the, the contemporary service did a lot of harmonies there. Right. It was kind of funny because we we spent those six months getting ready for that first coffee house gig, and spent a lot of time getting you know just two part harmony, which isn't that hard to do from our perspective. No. Right. But then we showed up at this coffee house, started singing harmonies, and everybody was like, "Oh my God, you're singing harmonies!" Like, like, like no one had ever done that before. We were a little surprised <laughs> well, that we got you that know, reaction. Th- th- well, it's, it's <laughs> funny because we thought, you know, when we were building the band back then, that you know our sort of called our, our sort of uh, differentiation was going to be the instruments, right? We're mm-hmm. playing mandolins, we're playing ukes, right. you know, and that's that, you know it's not unheard of, but it also isn't you know, very usual, right. you know? And so we thought that was going to be sort of one of the things that would differentiate us from, from other groups in the area. And we were surprised. I mean, you know, especially that first year it really became obvious after, you know, half a dozen or a dozen gigs, everybody was coming up to us and saying, it's the, you know, gosh, you guys' harmonies are great. Yeah. It was almost I, if, no, almost as if nobody else in town was singing harmony. Right. I blame, I, I blame American that, Idol in the voice. Right. <laughs> I've heard that before too. Uh, we've played a couple of places in my duo and, and a couple of people are like, I don't hear a lot of people doing harmonies. Usually yeah. it's like one person just, you know, singing in the group so it, it it is actually something not too many people do yeah and and so you know kind of picking up on that we we started hanging our hat on it right yeah. i mean the, the the songwriting and and you know whatever covers that we were choosing you know the covers that we were choosing to let go and covers that we were choosing to bring on you know that usually was the was you know the the decider you know can we put mm-hmm. some great harmonies on sure. this and if not we're probably not going to do it. See, know? I found, I, Brad said before, it's not that hard to do two-part harmony. When I first started doing it, I actually found it a little difficult because you have to focus on your part and not let the other person's part get in right. your ear. And then you're like, 
oh, I'm, you find yourself singing into their line. That, that to yeah. me is a hard part. If, if you're not used to it, because I was never, I wasn't a singer from a young age. I didn't come in to sing until later. So, well, we always struggle with that a little bit, just making sure we weren't stepping on each other in terms of uh, the notes, or if we did, it was on purpose. Um, but, com- <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I mean, for the most part, though, between Brad and I, it came pretty, pretty natural because both of us. Before we got to Province of Thieves, like he said, he was in a cappella groups. You know, I sang in the UNCC choir. Right. Uh, so singing parts, you know, to, to, to either one of us was not. Uh, so, you know, the experience there, before, there was, that's there what was, Yeah, there was, plenty of, yeah. there was plenty of background for us yeah. on it. So it wasn't that difficult. Now, we added a third singer for a couple of years, Steve Allen. And that's when we really had to hone down. Because adding adding one harmony to a melody like Brad it just said, has to be different from what the other it guy's just has, doing. that's all it has to be as long as right. that guy is not singing the melody right not on top of it it's a harmony right you add a third guy now you got to get discipline yes right yes um you know somebody you know usually the way we worked is you know we would put one person under the melody and one person over you know just to kind right. of keep it relatively mm-hmm. simple but it was a little more difficult, you know, when you start adding a third and even a yeah. fourth part, then, then you got to practice, you know? So you've guys got started province of thieves with just the two of you. How does it start to f- form into, into the full fledged band? How's that go? So, out? so I was auditioning for next level churches band. Okay. Um, and at the same time I was, I was auditioning to play lead guitar electric uh, and vocals. And another fellow was also auditioning, uh, Steve Allen. Um, and while we were sitting, uh, you know, uh, listening to other folks go through their auditions, we were just chatting and he told me, yeah, I play banjo. And I just heard Steve do his audition yeah. where he was playing acoustic guitar and singing. So I knew already the guy can play acoustic and sing really well. Uh, you know, Steve had a great voice. He's got a James Taylor esque Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, and he told me, yeah, you know, wife bought me a, a banjo and I've been playing this banjo for six months. And I said, you know what, what, you know, I got a little group, you know, would you be interested in joining? And, and, uh, and so once again, you know, a church connection brought another guy in, uh, and Steve, Steve was with us, uh, up until the close of last year. And, mm-hmm. And then uh, he got some bad news about his wife. Shelly is uh, Shelly's got uh, a lung cancer. So oh, Steve, awesome. yeah. So Steve had to make a family decision, and and we, we were one hundred percent behind him. Uh, you know, to, to to basically lay out of the band. Right. Uh, so we unfortunately haven't had him for the bulk of of twenty eighteen. Um, but he has been involved in the recording of Way to the Sky, our new album. So okay. he's, he's, there, there is going to be a Steve Allen presence on a new album for sure. So oh, that's awesome. That's good news. Yeah. So you guys start writing. How long ago you have this? Is, you're talking about uh, the new album, Way to the Sky. That's going to be your third album. That's right. So when did the first album come out? Uh, the first time we recorded at the beginning of 2014. Uh, it came out, I think, around April, sometime in April that year. Um, right. You know, the, all three of these albums, the experience has been <clears throat> really different. But that, that album was almost like a basement demo. It kind of felt like. Um, but we recorded it with Tom Ewer, um And he did a great job. He, um, he did a great job with the budget that we had to give him. Right. So, right. <laughs> yeah. That is always was, the stipulation, was, yes. isn't it? Or, or the budget. It, it was our budget. Have. It was our limitation more than Tom's. I, I want to be clear about that. So. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's right. So I, I think, what did we spend on that album? 1500 bucks to make that We album. recorded it for, for about 1200 and spent about, oh, that, about that much to um, actually burn the CDs and get the digital distribution. Yeah, but I was listening to someone online, guys, and it sounds good. Like I yeah. enjoyed it. You know, it's one of those things uh, we've talked about this and like, wouldn't it be great, you know, if we could have the budget we've got now or, you know, maybe the budget we'll have next year when this next album hits it huge uh, <laughs> <laughs> and just be able to go back and take that album and really put some production quality on it. You know, wouldn't it be good? Because I, I you know, the, the songs on that first album are, uh, I'm pretty proud of the songs. I mean, you know, the, Maybe the only thing I would do is go back and record them again and get rid of some of those, you know, you know how it is. You record something and you listen to a song and go, boy, I wish we could have, 
boy, I wish yeah. we could have fixed that. You know? But I think that's part <laughs> of the charm of those songs, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. You know, it, 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 it's it, is kind of, it, it's, it, it is kind of part of what makes the songs authentic. Um, sometimes I think there can be too much authentic. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, I don't know how you guys record, but I, I remember talking to Shannon Lee when Shannon Lee was on the other month, and she recorded her album, uh, Crystal Butterfly, and she said it was just all just live straight takes she right. didn't she didn't go in and re-edit and do all this stuff and i know everybody does something differently but to me i'm like i love old school recordings and even like you listen to old led zeppelin right um brown you are jimmy page is playing acoustic guitar and he's recording it and there's a plane coming over the overhead and the engineer's like hold on there's a plane jimmy and jimmy's like no no leave it leave it <laughs> and so they record that on the out i mean i yeah. love all those ticks yeah. and, and that's right. what that kind of i don't know makes my heart a little warm. You have yeah. to understand Shannon's a lot braver than we are. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting braver as time goes by. In fact, I think the new album is going to have a little bit more of that flavor to it. Mm -hmm. um, but we spent a lot of time, like the first album was more time constraints and we wish we could right. have done more. The second album, we actually put a lot of time into tweaking everything and making it arguably too perfect in some spots. Sure. But um, yeah. Uh, this one will be, uh, as Eric likes to put it, it will it will be a little janky in place, but it'll be charming. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do, how does the if that was the first album, what was the second album? How was how did that differ? Right. So we went to Boo English, uh, not Hall Studios in, in Weddington uh, for the second album. Okay. So it was a, it was a it was a step up um, in terms of you know, that's that's not to bad mouth Tom, but but you know Boo's got a got a, a studio, uh, you know, with the isolation booths and all that stuff yeah. and, and all the equipment and, you know, uh, just a bit more sophisticated recording setup, at least at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, that's still pretty nice. I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice I mean, not whole studios. I mean, we, we'd tell anybody, you know, we, we have nothing but great things to say about boo, uh, in his operation. Um, you know, and when we went in there with Laverna and no, it wasn't, it, it was not a situation where, you know, we did this kind of live thing. Now, typically what we'll do is we'll, you know, lay an original track on a, on a, uh, a scratch track. So. It's, a, you know, a scratch track with, with a, uh, what am I thinking of a metronome, mm -hmm. you know, right. just to keep us on the right pace. And then of course, you know, go back and retrack everything. So um, it's probably more like most bands record than, than, you know, just opening mics up yeah. and, right. you know, playing along and, you know. well, and the reality is there were on that album, there were, there were some songs we've been playing live for a while that we went and did and some songs that we had just finished writing and we were still figuring That's them right. out as we went through the studio. So if we tried to do them live, they would have been a disaster. We had to kind of go through and hone track by track to get oh, wow. them where they were. So, yeah, that's right. It, you know, there was at least one song on that album that we were almost writing as we went. Uh, well, and and actually, it actually, it, 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 <laughs> was, it was, it was one of Brad's that uh, we don't play live, but, um, I heard it in my head and they just couldn't grasp it until we got the, all the tracks down and I said, that's it. That's what I was talking about. <laughs> I'm blanking on the name of the song, which uh, uh, sweeter was, cup, sweeter cup. Yeah. Okay. And actually sweeter cup on the, on the Laverna album is actually one of my favorites. Now I yeah, listen to it. There's some guy doing a really great guitar solo on that one. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the, that's the thing. When you talk about songwriting, I mean, some songs just kind of like materialize yes. and they're fully formed and they're, and everyone just gets it and you go. And then there are some songs that you mm -hmm. got to approach from a completely different angle. Yeah. It's figure out all the pieces and put it all together. You know, there's some songs where they're driven off lyrics, some songs that are driven off a riff. I mean, right. You just got to be open to wherever they, wherever the song comes from sure. and wherever it takes you. So yeah, every song's different. So how about the new album, Way to the Sky? What are we doing with that? Uh, and this is a, again, like we said, we've, we've changed studios every time, but it's really not because we have any issue with the previous studio. Sure, it's more, right. we're, we're looking to grow. We're, we're looking like who else Different can experience. we get knowledge from? Who else can we learn from and do right. something different? Yeah. And we don't want, we don't want this album to sound like the last album. And then we don't necessarily have to change studios for it to sound different, but, um, you know, in this case, we'd been, you know, we really felt like to, to step up with this one, we might want to do a producer. Okay. Um, so in, in the case of Laverna with Boo, you know, Boo was our recording engineer, but he was not really acting in the role of producer. Okay. Um, 
And, uh, and we had a few folks tell us, you know, you guys really ought to be talking to Eric Lovell because Eric, you know, is, is, is more on the folk side, whereas Boo is more of a rock guy. Mm -hmm. Um, Eric's more on the folk side and he is a producer. He will act in the Mm -hmm. role of producer. So we went, we went to him and, and, uh, you know, wound up, you know, with him for, for this particular album. So what did he do for you that, that you hadn't had previously? He told us where we were making horrible mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> he was honest with, and, and again, not not horrible, but I mean, he he really just helped um, guide us toward a, a more mature you know sound. I mean, again, when you're just when it's all in your head and you're just repeating it over and over, you, yeah, you fall into ruts and you, it's hard to break out of them. He kind of helped us find some new spaces to play in and um, you know, helped move the songs into new, into new spaces. Sometimes, and we brought a song in and it didn't change dramatically. Sometimes it started off as a blues song and became sort of an island funk song. I mean, it's, we, we saw some interesting things yeah. happen as we went through the process. Were you open to him always? Or were there some of those like, you know, hissy fits that the we, musicians we, you know, we, have? With we, we have, we do have a rule and it's always been kind of the rule that, you know, that, that the songwriter, whoever the person is that originates the song. So, I mean, one of the first things I'd say is province of thieves is a vehicle for Brad and I's songwriting and the reason why I say that is it's not so much a songwriting collaboration. Um, Brad and I don't, it's very rare that we get together and write a song. That's okay. not really the way it works. You know, we're, we're two individual songwriters that come in the province of thieves with our songs. And then we let the province of thieves vehicle, take the song where it's going to go. So when you write the song, let's say it's one of Greg's songs, you you write in the song. Do you come in with the framework of the song or do you have the song like completely conceptualized and you're like, this is what the bass part's going to do, that this is what I want the it, drummer to do, you know, this is the I, vocal I, I wish I could say that, you know, it really depends on the song. The answer is yes. There, there, <laughs> <laughs> there, there have been, Brad, Brad has brought some songs in where, and that that's what kind of what I was going to with the rule is that even if the producer says, I want to take it in this direction, if the songwriter says no, I'm not, you know, this, whoever the original songwriter is, is the last word. Right. But um, we hired a producer for a reason. Right. Right. And we hired that producer to, to, to listen to what we're doing and tell us, you know, frankly, this sucks. This is great. Let's go in the great direction. Let's go away from the suck direction. Right. You know, and we needed that. You know, we needed somebody outside of our universe to say, you know, you really need to, you know, you need to cut this out and yeah. add this, you right. know, you know, and this part think, isn't working. Right. You think it is, right. but it really doesn't work well. Right. Right. And then it's good to have, like I said, it's good to have somebody outside of the, of the, of the, the orbit of the band yeah. kind of saying, you know, this, this is what I'm hearing, you know? Okay. Um, and it's just a time factor for me. I mean, you get, you, you work on the song and it's in your head a very specific way. And when yeah. something needs to change, um, I just had to train everyone. This is how you need to work with me. I'm not going to accept it day one, but I'm going to recognize I need to step away for a couple of days and absorb what you told me. And then I'll be fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's kind of how it's worked. I mean, right. and, and the song's always, I look back and the song's always in a better place hmm. as a result of allowing the collaboration. And that's not to say we weren't successful with that on previous albums. It's just that we did it internally. I mean, Brad would bring a song in or I would bring a song in and, and you know, greatest wonders I think was a good, you know, that was the first track of the Laverna album. And I can remember Brad bringing it in and, and uh, I think it was just the, the three of us at the time, uh, Brad and myself and Steve and, and Steve and I both got really excited about the song but we told Brad, it was like, you, you know, your bridge, I don't remember what it was. You had a bridge <laughs> section that we really liked, but it was not long enough. And we said, hey, take that section and make that the bulk of the song and right. write something else for the bridge. And I don't remember what Brad did, but he, 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 he took it. He went back. He did take a lot of what we told him, and he brought it back in Greatest Wonders. You know, we, hmm. just, we loved it, you know. Uh, but, but that's not unusual for us to, yeah. you know, one of us to bring a song in and then the other folks in the band go, Hey, you know, what about this? What about that? You know, and sometimes we, you know, we'll bring a song in like Muscadine is an example. So Muscadine was on the Laverna album. And that was one of those songs that I wrote that just, sometimes I have songs that I just have to labor over for six months. They just, 
you know, and, and they turn out to be good songs, but it just takes me a long time to get them fleshed mm-hmm. out. And then I have songs that I write in an hour. Right. And Muscadine was one of the songs that I wrote in an hour. Uh, it just kind of popped in my head. It, you know, the arrangement sort of settled right down. I, I, th- there was some, you know, there was, there, there was some massagings of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, it, it came really quickly mm-hmm. and the band just, you know, they, they took it and played it and it, it just, it flushed out really quickly, but that that's not always every song kind of has it's, its own. Ca- it it yeah. always has, it. they all have their own character. You know, some of them, uh, you know, like I said, are really labors of love and others are others. Just They're all labors of love. They, they are. They are. Some just, of them are just tough love. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, let's take a listen to uh, Way to the Sky, the title cut off the new album. Touch the ground. Rise up, roaring loud, wet from the clouds. Every direction ever bending on the sea or on dry land, miles and miles it turns unending, and yet despite how grand collapses beneath the weight of the sky. Like that track, Brad. That's one of your songs. That's right. Can can you fill us in about that song? Yeah, this is one. I mean, a lot of what I do um, is I'm just always looking for just different angles to come at a song. Right. Uh, with this particular one, I was exploring uh, something called a shortcut capo, <laughs> which <laughs> I'm sure people have experimented with, um, but um, just was come up with some different chord progressions that I thought sounded cool. A, a um, shortcut. Sorry, a shortcut capo. Is that the one which just just Covers a couple of strings. Covers three strings. I, I knew it, but I didn't know like I didn't know it had a name. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it covers the uh, third, fourth, and fifth string. Okay. Um, so and there's some you know it, it simplifies a couple things, but kind of gives you the ability to mm-hmm. do some funky sounding chords and then go back to some of the regular you know chords on top of it and mix it all together. Mm-hmm. So that was just it was a chord progression I came up with that. Um, whereas I, I often come at songs with lyrics first. That one was chords first and then it was just kind of a what kind of images is that evoking uh that led to the words um so the lyrics were uh and it's it's really a song that's just about the perspective of um a bird flying in the sky and Mm -hmm. looking at the curve of the earth and or curve of the earth and not fully understanding what he's seeing essentially was that one of those tunes that took you a while was that with a quick tune uh, the chords came quick and I played those chords for probably three months before I got any lyrics, but then the lyrics popped out in about a day, yeah. you know, once it happened. Gosh, so. the songwriting's funny like that. It sometimes yeah. it just pops in and then other times you're like, I've got these chords. I just don't have anything else else go with it right now. I like this part. Let me record it. Keep it over on the side. Right. And I'll come back to it. All right. Well, let's check out, uh, Bards of Wales. This is one of Greg's tunes off the new album. That's right. <laughs> He sits astride his tawny steed For I will see if Wales indeed Gladly accepts my rule, said he In truth this Wales star is a gem Only the fairest in your crown, said him The stream and field rich harvest yield Only the fairest hail and down be seen Dark 
frogs or whales, you rascal beards. Well, none of you for it would cheer. To serve my needs and share my deeds, then let a grateful part of be. So can you tell us about that one, Greg? Um, so th- this is a really interesting song. And I, I was, you know, I'd put my kids on the bus, you know, in the morning. And I, I work from home. I have the luxury of, uh, you know, getting the kids off to school and, right. and then just kind of going upstairs to start work. And uh, usually my I start my my mornings just reading the newspaper on my iPads and, and a coffee. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, it's a, it's really a, an easy life, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> the New York times had just, had just run this, uh, had this article about an old poem from, from a guy named Ernie Janus and Ernie, um, had been asked, and this was the late 18th century. He had been asked to basically write a narcissistic poem up by the Hungarian king. So he was he was basically the bard right. for a Hungarian king. And uh, he didn't like being asked to, to basically write a poem that did nothing but praise this king mm. as essentially what he was being asked to do. So he writes this poem about, uh, you know, King Edward uh, of England, uh, Longshanks, right? Mm. If, you, yeah. if, you, if you watched uh, Braveheart. Braveheart, thank you. You watch Braveheart, that's the guy. Okay. that he's writing a song about and you know and it's not a song i'm sorry it's a poem uh, but he writes this poem about uh king Ed- edward invading wales and then more or less forcing the welch to uh sing songs of praise to him mm-hmm. right and nobody will sing him any praises so he <laughs> goes to the bards and he says you know you need to write me a song you know of praise and basically the bards say we're not going to do that. You know, basically they stick their middle finger up at him. Right. And then, you know, King Edward basically kills all the bards in Wales. <laughs> right. It's, it's very dark. Didn't get a song. It's, 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 it's a very, cheerful song. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's dark poem. It's like five, you right. know, five pages long, but it, you know, I thought, I thought it appropriate just because, you know, we're seeing this narcissism in some of our leaders. I won't mention, you know, but, but it, it was timely in terms of, you know, kind of what we were, experiencing in, in, in America with, in, in basically all politicians sure. are narcissists to a certain degree. I mean, you have to be a, a narcissist sure. to, to run a campaign, to be yeah. elected. You don't do anything but talk about yourself, right? <laughs> it, it doesn't matter, you know, which side of the aisle you're on. Um, yeah. but you know, I, I thought I, I read this poem sitting there and I was like, wow, that, you know, I like the poem. Uh, it's like five pages long. I had to take sort of the point of the poem and really condense it you know, okay. into this three minute song that said what the, what the story's about and ended. Um, but here was one where I started with somebody else's basic lyrics and I had to turn it into a song and, and felt like uh, at the end, once I was done with it, that we'd been pretty successful mm-hmm. uh, as far as how this song came out. And this is another one where, yeah, I wasn't really sure about this song. It was, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting, let's take it to the band, you know, and the first time the band played through it, it was ragged, but I could hear that this song's, this song's got some potential. And by the time we got done with it in the, in the studio, you know, we'd added fiddle, uh, and it wow. just came out really, really great. I was really, really impressed. The first mix I got of it, uh, from Eric was like, wow, that, that really came out uh, really well. Are your guys earlier albums, are they available only on your website or where else can we find them? Laverna can be found in most of those places. Yeah. You can, um, I mean, you get the digital downloads, at iTunes, uh, Amazon, uh, CD baby, sure. uh, of course, from our website. Um, and then CDs as well. Okay. If you still have a CD player. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 now the first album, probably, I, I think you can still get it on Amazon and iTunes. It's not on Spotify. Right. Um, really the best place is our website. And I only say that because if you, if you buy it from our website, Mm -hmm. you know, we get the whole, right. (laughs) We get the whole purchase instead Um, of Spotify and iTunes, you know, take it there. Please do, you know, please go to the website and buy the albums because it's, it's it's always better for the, for the artist that way. Yes. Well, much success to you guys. I, I'm really, I really enjoy it. And if you get, if you're listening and you want to check out problems of thieves, go to their website, See when they're playing, see where they're playing, and and head out and see them because they're they're really fantastic. To check out live. 
thank you. All right, you. fellas, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. And uh, best of luck to you in 2019. Thanks. Thank appreciate you. it. All right. Bye. And that will bring episode 16 of the Queen City Music Podcast to a close. If you are a musician or otherwise involved in the music scene here in our fair city and would like to be a guest on the QCMP, or if you just want to let me know your thoughts about the podcast, reach out to me at qcmusicpodcast at gmail.com. Until next month, get out there and support your local music scene. Bye.